Welcome to Total Talks. Welcome to Total Talks. Welcome to Total Talks. How's everybody doing today? This is Antonio Moore coming to you from Tone Talks. Looking forward to having a, a powerful discussion today about gender, intersectionality, race, and the history of it all. Talk about it from a, a standpoint of data, talk about it from a standpoint of wages. Uh, incarceration, unemployment, we're going to get into it all. Let's let everybody fall in. So I'm looking at the chat right now. I expect to have about 1,500 people live. Hopefully we can get this to 25 to 30,000 people overall. Um, this is going to be a heavy topic. For that reason, I'll probably take calls toward the end of the show because I want to get through the whole show and then give people a chance to call in and voice their opinion. Only thing I ask is let's be respectful. This will be a very respectful show. And no way am I trying to disrespect anyone or their work, but I will tell the truth about whether that work is accurate or not in my view, based on looking at the data, looking at the uh, realities of where we're going, looking at the realities of blackness in America and not holding any punches. So this is Tone Talks. Please use the chat. When I say the chat, I'm talking about YouTube. We're gonna have about 1500 people debating this topic in YouTube. Um, use the super chat support this channel patreon tone talks but first of all let's do some logistics subscribe donate um, subscribe to the channel right now on YouTube press the bell get the notification thank you so much for taking your time this Thursday afternoon to have this discussion so this discussion is intersectionality black girl magic and the economic collapse of black males we're having this discussion in the context of a, a world that has basically kind of decided that we're gonna go down this intersectionality path, whether the data supports it or not. What my plan is to go back in history and look at you, look at Bureau of Labor data and show you the problems with the way the analysis was applied for intersectionality to move to looking at wages. Well, actually I'm gonna go through different points in this thing. I'm going to go from incarceration to abuse to wages to unemployment in present day to kind of show you the reality of where we're at. And in the end, I'm going to also talk about social dominance theory, which I think is either you can see it as a wing off of intersectionality if applied properly, or you can actually see it as oppositional. We'll get into that. And that's the idea that the outgroup male is actually the most oppressed group and when I get to the end of the data you'll see why that actually does apply here in America. So we're in the chat. Let's have this discussion. Let's be spirited but also be respectful. I know a lot of people are wound up in this discussion whether they understand the content around it or not. They have created identities on top of this idea of do double minority status uh, of oppressing oppression being duplicated based on combining gender with race what i see is as a result you see a lot of things going on where gender actually ends up displacing race so I, what kind of triggered me was brooke baldwin and this whole thing that she did here huddle um she has this book coming out uh how women unlock their collective power nothing wrong with talking about that if that's truly where you stop what, what she had is this thing where she talked to these black 19 black female judges in Harris County, Texas, who were all elected at the same time. Supposedly that's the first group that she profiles. One of the things that I see right now, before I get into the specifics of Harris County, Texas, the racial realities of lynchings in Harris County, Texas, is from Black Lives Matter and Trayvon Martin all the way to George Floyd, you see this use of black male oppression to shift over to a people of color, kind of all lives that centers black female leadership and avoids the reality of how we got there. And we got there through those, those people, George Floyd, Trayvon Martin, Eric Garner, living lives that led them to the moments that captured our, all of America's like visual on race. But, you don't hear black men really coming out talking about how intersectionality shows that this is the the connection point between being male and being black. You don't hear black men coming out saying, I don't need you to speak for me because we are talking about blackness and allowing everyone in blackness to speak for us. 
So how did we get here where we know the numbers or some of us know the numbers? And for some of you guys, I've taken pieces of shows I've done over the past few years and you'll see that in a second. And we still allow for these kind of like narratives. We understand the reality of Freddie Gray, of Alton Sterling. Don't get me wrong, we see Breonna Taylor and we see Sandra Bland, but we understand the, the, the volume of the Freddie Grays, the pure volume of the Eric Garners. But we also understand black men go to prison like nothing we've ever seen in the history of mankind. Prison, which is right next to death. You might ask, don't black women go to prison too? I will answer that barely. And I'm not asking for more of them to go to prison. What I am actually dealing with is the consequence from not dealing with the reality of what it means when black men are pretty much the incarcerated group in America. I want to talk. I'm just going to slow it down because I know a lot of people are going to get confused. I got a lot of content to get through. So we have Brooke Baldwin and, and these judges. But what she doesn't really show is this outgoing CNN anchor Baldwin rails against the network rails against the network about a lack of women in leadership saying the most influential and highest paid anchors are men now you can go read that on your own draw from what you like but what she has done is taking the whiteness out of the narrative and interjected gender and done it through the lens of black womanness and then somehow binded black men into a privilege that they never access. And when I say never, I mean never. But the problem is, again, leadership. Saying leadership are men. Anchors are men. So she says all that, right? Y'all following me? We have the backdrop of the huddle book and we have these black women as her first group that she profiles. So now we're talking about men, not white men. She's actually using gender to not talk about whiteness and classism within whiteness. The reason why we know that is, is we can go to the CNN masthead. So when we go to the CNN masthead and we look at leadership and anchors, and this is just the top part, but pretty much all the way down, it's about the same. It's checkers, white men, white women, with one, two black women, one maybe black man. Checkers, white men, white women. What she is talking about is something that she needs to settle at home in her group, needs to settle without talking about men and talking about white power. That white power that not just white men hold, but white women as well. See, all of this has been a bit of a con. And the reason why I talk about it as a con is because what you see is this movement where we don't deal with the fact that America had slavery, 1600, 1700, 1800. That slavery really bled into 1900. But we'll talk about Jim Crow lasting into the 60s. But we create a narrative as if we had female versions of the same thing. Now, I'm not saying that to diminish that there wasn't oppression of females, but nothing in, at all measured up to what happened to black folks because they were black folks in America for hundreds of years. I'm looking at so much of this discussion and I don't think anything really, really characterizes this other than these black women are black women that are there to protect black communities as judges. The reason why we know that is we can go to Harris County and I want to go back to Harris County just to be specific. And Harris County takes steps to face a history of racial lynchings. So they have racial lynchings, not gender lynchings, Racial lynchings. This is the same county electing these 19 black women. When Deborah Bollock Salone took a bus to visit the country first museum about slavery and lynching, she was overwhelmed by what she saw. Giant rails hung from ceilings inside the Legacy Museum. Each one bore the names of lynching victims across the counties across the U.S. One included the names of four black men who were hung in Harris County. Harris County. So much of this is people not getting honest about the realities of 
what are we doing here if we elevate gender and diminish race in a nation that had hundreds of years of slavery followed by Jim Crow and now we have mass incarceration of black men like nothing we've seen before but we create theories that avoid the facts and truth of what happens when you combine gender and race. You got Harris County doing the work. Harris County Commissioner's Court approves eight, eight measures to reform criminal justice. So these women, I would hope, would do the work of racial justice. Now people would say, well, isn't there gender justice to do too? Ask Harris County white women if there is. Ask them about their incarceration rate. Ask them about the realities of what they face, the oppressions, the things of the sort. And I guarantee you nothing will measure up to the incarceration of black men in Harris County. The lynchings of black men and the oppression of black women because of them being black, not just because they're women in Harris County, because we were enslaved, followed by Jim Crow. Can I... I'm in the chat. Let me let me get to it because I wanna I want I'm I'm just talking theoretical now and then we're gonna move into data. To be fair, intersectionality as it's defined is the interconnected nature of social categorization such as race, class, and gender as they apply to a given individual or group, regarded as creating overlapping and interdependent systems of discrimination or disadvantage. In nowhere do, in there does it say black women. And nowhere in there does it say uh, white women. And nowhere in there does it say black men. You have to follow the definition and allow it to tell you what happens when you combine gender and race. That is not what has happened with intersectionality. What has happened is that it had, it had an agenda before it was created, and now everything is folded in, no matter what the data is, and I'll show you in a second, to make it work. So I, I know that this was created, as I understand it, in, uh, whether in whole or in part, by a Kimberly Crenshaw. I watched her speak. I went back and watched and read her original paper. No disrespect to her, but her paper lacked numbers. Her original paper in 1989 lacked so many numbers. Demarginalizing the intersection of race and sex, a black feminist critique of anti-discrimination doctrine out of the University of Chicago. This is the original paper for intersectionality, Kimberly Crenshaw. I watch her speak at the Woman at the Woman of the World Festival. I want to be fair and read a quote that she said at the Woman of the World Festival, and then I'll show you how the data just undermines the quote. Now, if intersectionality is a history project, let it be that. But if it is an actual application against both present time, and even the present time when she was writing in 1989, then the paper fell short that she did because it should have continued into 1980, and it didn't. It just kind of just stopped her manufacturing in whatever era she was talking about, the 60s maybe, late 50s. I'll get into that too. I have the Bureau. See, you can't do the, 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 the paper without having Bureau of Labor numbers. She don't have that. She has cases but not Bureau of Labor numbers. So we understand the oppression that she's talking about and whether it's actually real. Now, I don't know if that was omitted on purpose or on accident, but you can't do the study or the paper that you do without those numbers. Because if you don't, then you don't understand that it doesn't really work. I just want to get into it. You can go to my YouTube. I mean, um, you can go to my Twitter. I have information there that I'll be talking about. And this is a direct quote from Kimberly Crenshaw. In the context of employment discrimination, intersectionality was meant to draw attention to the many ways black women were being excluded from employment, industrial plants, and elsewhere, were segregated by gender and race. Let me read it again. In the context of employment discrimination, intersectionality was meant so you set out with an agenda before you actually allowed the actual, I guess, study or theory of gender and race to actually just show you what it says. It was meant to draw attention to the many ways black women, not people, but black women were being excluded from employment in industrial plants and elsewhere that were segregated. 
Segregated is a very interesting word because segregated makes you think of what? Jim Crow. There was no white female Jim Crow. There was no female Jim Crow. This is a, to use segregated in this context, especially when you go through the data I'm going to show in a second, is highly problematic. But let's continue on by, we're segregated by gender and race. Gender coming first in her speech. Specifically, and I'm not saying the order meant that she was coming, but they're interchangeable or gender came first. I don't have no idea what she's talking about. Specifically, black jobs, that's what she calls them, were available to blacks who were men. And women's jobs were available to women who were white. That's not true. That's what I mean. Like, so, so her original paper, and you can go read it yourself. Oh, it's, uh, it's, it's on the internet, demarginalizing the intersection of race and sex. Because it doesn't have Bureau of Labor num numbers, she's making assertions that weren't altogether true. She's broadly saying them, then backing out and saying, well, I'm just talking about industrial jobs. Well, what years? Because we're talking about 1600, 1700, 1800, 1900, all the way into present. Are you talking about a five-year window, a 10-year window, a 15-year window? Is this a history project? You're writing in 89. So we have 80 and 70. Are you talking about those moments? I'm just, I'm just here, to, here to have it out. Coming back to her quote, specifically black jobs were available to blacks who were men and women's jobs were available to women who were white. Black women who were blacks that were not men and women that were not white were not able to be hired in certain industries. So we start to unpack this thing and ask the question, well then you're gonna give us some numbers, right? She fails to do that, so I'm gonna do that for you today. I wanna do that in the first section of the, of, of the, of the discussion. The second discussion, I'm gonna go from history into present. After that, we will take calls. The call in number is going to be 310 388 3499. Now, when I look at this, this theory, in effect, takes white men, diminishes their whiteness, elevates their maleness in direct opposition to history for me. And the problem is that. What you see is that she wrote her paper in 89, and 89 is an important year. If you recall, I interviewed Thomas Shapiro, who wrote the book Black Wealth, White Wealth. He coined the term racial wealth gap. We had a spirited conversation, and he agreed that he should not have called it racial wealth gap. But more importantly, he said a specific thing. He said that wealth data was not released until the 90s. So she's writing this before we understand wealth data. As a result, I don't think she fully grasped when she comes up with this concept that it is not about work just alone. It's about wealth. So that wealth is held in white families. That wealth is transferred through in the hands of white families. At the end of the day, that's why the marriage unit is so important. See, you have to understand that in effect, by marrying each other, white men and white women become one at least in terms of legal, like application of wealth and everything of the sort. By inheriting, they inherit from fathers that might have done all of the, of the white male patriarchal oppression all across the nation. There is no unique relationship that black men have with white men that mimics that at all. And the way she applies this is as though we just talking about just like work in a specific industry. If you look at the discussion, she's talking as though black men are taking jobs that are elite in these industrial jobs. They are the lowest labor workers. They're the lowest labor workers taking the most dangerous work. In addition, we're talking about another era, and I'll get into it in a second. We're moving from 60% marriage rates for black people to somewhere around 30% now, depending on education level, 30 to 40%. It's a vastly different world, a world created by white men. Let me give you an analogy. Today, just like at CNN, many of the chief diversity officers all across this nation are black women. I don't know a black man who will say to that black women, that it is your fault that, you, that those jobs are only going to black women. That would be totally incorrect. 
How then do we look back at manufacturing jobs for that black men fresh off of sharecropping farms, fresh out of slavery were getting and blame the black men instead of the, the system and getting honest about why that system did that, let alone the, the black, um, the white women who also made decisions. The reason we know they made decisions is you know, we go all the way to the book, uh, they, they were her property and we look at it. The, there's a great article, I believe on the History Channel, the massive overlooked role of female slave owners. Slaveholding parents typically gave their daughters more enslaved people than land, says Jones Robert Rogers in her book. They owned people. What this whole theory does is gets misapplied first, and second, diminishes the, the true reality and centrality of ADOS race in America. I have no idea how we got here, but we got a generation of African-American women across this nation that have decided to create an overlapping that history doesn't really set to. I just want to, I'm, I'm going to get to it. I know that this is going to be a, 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 a show where we slow everything down. She writes this. So we go back to intersectionality and Crenshaw. She writes this in 89. I don't see in the pages that I read, which is the, all the pages, I don't see a lot of talk about incarceration, mass incarceration, which is raging by 89. Not sure if she understood that when she was writing it. I don't see talk about the rise of the black female professional that was clear in the Bureau of Labor data by 1980. What I do see is an attempt to go into something that you're supposed to allow to show you what the application of gender and race together are doing and already have your narrative set. Now, I'm not saying that black women don't have a unique oppression. There are several kinds of unique oppression. I mean, how many short men couldn't get jobs at manufacturing or small men, I mean midgets, like disabled men, that they would be considered that, couldn't get jobs at factories that is a unique oppression. What I'm saying is that when we look at the value, when we look at the overall story of, of, of America, we are dealing with a society that through social dominance theory has affected and, and, and basically subjugated black families to a second tier economically. I just want to, I just want to get into it. I'm not, you know, you can go read her paper for yourself. Let me share a little bit to you. To the extent that this this is her this is the core paper for intersectionality by Kimberly Crenshaw. To the extent that this general description is accurate, the following analogy can be useful in describing how black women are race are marginalized in the in, in, interface between anti-discrimination law and race and gender hierarchies. Imagine a basement which contains all people who are disadvantaged on the basis of race, sex, class, sexual preference, age, and or physical ability. These people are stacked, feet standing on shoulders, with those on the bottom being disadvantaged by the full array of factors up to the very top, where the head of all those disadvantaged by a singular factor brush up against the ceiling. Their ceiling is actually the floor above, which only those who are not disadvantaged in any... Understand, we had slavery and Jim Crow, Miss Crenshaw. I have no idea what this whole room of, of, of one oppressions is going by, but I think there's a severe lack of understanding of the history of this nation, lynchings of, 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 of the, you know, I mean, it's just awful. <laughs> I mean, I don't even understand. And then when you look at the numbers and the data and that I'll go through in a second, I don't know how she got here and I don't know how this was allowed to actually set. I just know that it is highly problematic and doesn't really make a lot of sense to me. But I'm going to make it like make a lot less sense to you now. So when you do those kind of things and you're making the assessment and when you're drawing an inference on, on whether everything from manufacturing jobs to the impact of jobs even past that, it is your job to put this in your source to start making these discussions. In her speeches, I've watched one or two, she doesn't really use data. Also, what I saw is that even in that original paper, it wasn't a lot of data. But I found some data so I can be able to understand what I'm talking about and not just talk generally. The Bureau of Labor every decade or so releases these reports. Here's one here on a, on a, in a period between 1940 and 1952. I have another one here for the 70s. 
And just to share some information from each report with you, employment and income of Negro workers, 1940 to 1952. Negro workers in terms of employment and income were less were less well off than white workers in 1952. Although the comparison was more favorable than in 1940, the improvement was due almost entirely to the fact that Negroes in shifting to non-agricultural industries were able to get better jobs and were therefore less heavily concentrated in the traditionally unskilled and low wage occupations. Again, we're saying Negroes, not Negro men, not Negro women, Negroes. The civilian labor force in 1952, jumping down, totaled nearly 63 million and included 56.9% of the white and 62.2% of the Negro population of working age. The reason why our number is higher because more of the women have jobs, more of our women have jobs at that point than their women, despite the marriage rate being, being high. Virtually all of the difference was due to the fact that 44.2% of the Negro women compared to 32.7% of the white women were working or seeking work. In 1951, only in the age group from 18 to 24 was the proportion of Negro women in the labor force below that for whites. Just going through this. About one in four white women was in the labor force in 1940. The ratio was approximately one in three in 1952. Married women were responsible for most of this increase. The proportion of white married couples with wife with a wife in the labor force having grown from 11% in 1940 to more than 22% in 1950. Among Negro couples, the comparable figures were 24%, 24% and 37%, considerably above those for white couples on both Size. Uh, so unemployment rates also are consistently higher for Negroes than for whites, for Negroes than for whites, for Negroes than for whites, not Negro men, not Negro women, Negroes than for whites. From 1940 to 1952, unemployment decreased from 8.1 million to 1.7 million, from about 14.5% to 2.7% of the civilian labor force. In the latter years, 4.6% of the Negroes and 2.4% of the whites in the labor force were unemployed. The overall unemployment rate was then 5% among men in this age group. The rates were 10.5% for Negroes and 3.8% for whites in the age of 25 to 34. Moving down to industrial and occupational distribution. The reason this is important is we go all the way back and the, and the premise of the intersectionality, at least that, as I've heard her write it, hangs on this industrial opportunity that black men blossomed under that when you look at the bls data falls apart not because black men didn't have manufacturing jobs to some small degree but because they were like the laborers they were the lowest level this is before mechanization not a lot it's not forklifts it's lifting rocks and you don't know what they're doing in there what kind of dangerous chemicals and then black women are like maids and everything we were all oppressed as black folks so now to do a history project and then elevate womanness and elevate white women's oppression to the level of race through intersectionality leaves us in a confused state where a generation of young women don't understand the calamity that happened to black, the kind of oppression through slavery that happened to black folks. Please support the channel because I want to get into it. I'm not here for anything but looking at specifics because Somebody else didn't do this work. In terms of, this is industrial and occupa occupational distribution. This is her area. This is what she hanging her hat on. Never gave up. She doesn't give years. She doesn't give amounts. She doesn't give wage amounts. It's just real general when she says it and then she walks off. And a lot of the people don't know how to do like basic like, well, what are you saying? What year are you talking about? What actual job are you talking about? In terms of the types of employers for whom they worked and kinds of jobs they had, the differences between Negroes and whites narrowed somewhat more between 1940 and 1952 than did differences in the overall employment ratios. The most striking change in both the industrial and occupational composition of employment was a much more pronounced shift away from agricultural for Negroes than for whites. The geographical distribution of Negro employment also changed because 90% of all Negro agricultural workers in 1940 were in the South. Many of them moved to urban areas in the North and West as well as the South. Let's 
say that in a more more clear way. Black folks far too often were ran up out of the South, off their farms, into all of these uh, communities to do low-level uh, jobs to survive, whether it be cleaning a house or cleaning a factory. I need you to see all of that because I hear her talking like this is some kind of gift. And I'm saying this not just about her, but about so many young women that don't do the work for the position that they come talk about. They talk about it on Clubhouse. They talk about it on Twitter. They talk about it so many places, but they never talk about that Bureau of Labor data. I just want to talk. Please support the channel. Share this video. We're getting into it. As a result, during the 1940s, the proportion of all employed Negroes working in the South fell from three-fourths to two-thirds, and the Negro population became predominantly urban for the first time. Agriculture in the 1950 still represented about a fifth of the Negro workers, and the service industries continued to provide jobs for about a third. While these two industries groups remained the largest source of Negro employment, they were considerably less important in the total than in 1940, when more than two-thirds of all employed Negroes worked in one or the other. In contrast, less than a third of all white workers were so employed in 1950. I just, I'm walking you through this Bureau of Labor because nobody else seems to have done this. Hopefully it's a young male or female in college that reads this and is able to share this with their cohort and, and, get, and get people on the right page because you got to do the work. You can't just let people talk. Negroes made many gains, Negroes again, not women or men, in non-agricultural employment during World War II. When new opportunities for industrial employment were open to them, in general, their wartime position has been retained in the post-war years. And in fact, even larger proportions of employed Negroes were working in non-agricultural industries in 1952 than in 1950. Negroes made notable employment gains in manufacturing, construction, and trade from 1940 to 1952. And the proportion employed in the domestic and personal service uh, segment of the, of the of the service industries declined in spite of slight post-war upswing, which culminated in 1950. So I got a chart. The chart breaks things down by occupational group. It has white and non-white. At that time, non-white is black folk. On this chart, you begin to see how it falls apart, what they have talked about as far as this advantage that black men had, and you start to see that the oppression was just oppression for black men and for black women. Managers, officials, and proprietors excluding farm. You see that black men, 1.6 work in that, and 0.8 of black females work in that, clerical. You see 1.2 of males work in that, you see 1% of black females work in that. Craftsmen and foremen. You see 4.4% of black men and you see 0.2% of black females. The way she wrote it is you would think that 50% of black men had this job. And also that doesn't understand this is before mechanization. So that job don't always mean that, that we're, uh, it's cause it says foremen and kindred workers. It don't mean that you're not lifting stones or something inside of the factory or heavy parts. I need to talk because I'm seeing a lot of people and they're not pulling the data. But by 1950, when we look, because what I just gave you was 1940, as far as managers, officials, and proprietors, males are 2% and black women are 0.5% of, the, of them are working in that field. Clerical and kindred workers, 3.4% of black men are working in that field by 1950. Understand that 4% of black women are working in that field by 1950. So what I'm just, what I'm showing you is something that'll show up later. You see this uptick where black women are above black men in clerical work by 1950. The, the problem with what she did is that she told you a part of the story and omitted the overall narrative. She omitted the backdrop of slavery and Jim Crow to me. But in addition, this whole analysis omits what happened from 1950, 1960 and across a multiple of sectors. In particular, as we move into white collar work from 1970 to 1980. I'll talk about it in a second and show you how, in, in effect, black women have 40% more white collar jobs by the time we get from 72 to 80. And that's not 
me trying to say that to, to disparage black women, but it's to ask you, where does intersectionality not allow you to deal with the fact that when you add the two things together, it is black men that are suffering a great deal of oppression as a result of being the outgroup. You look at so many different areas and you see the same thing. You can go look at this chart yourself. I'll pull it up in the final version. Uh, service work is an area where black men are at 12.5% and black women are at 17.8. Farm laborers, black men are at 11.3. Black women are at 8.8. .8. All these things are within range depending on where you get no press at. But what she leaves out, because she's not looking at wealth, is that white women live in the home with the white male and inherit all of that wealth, and she just kind of elevates gender and race and then slams them together. And then slams them together and doesn't deal with the actual data that shows us that when you slam them together, you don't come out with a double minority just because you're a woman and black. you got to be far more nuanced than that. Let's move forward, though, because it even shows us even clearer Again, she writes this paper in 1989. This Bureau of Labor report that I have right here is on the 70s. So it comes out early 80s. This is 10 years or less, right around there, 10 years or so of before she writes her paper. But instead of adding the information from this, because it so damages the argument, it's just left out. What this paper is called is Blacks in the 1970s. Blacks in the 1970s. Did they scale the job ladder? Follow me. Throughout the 1960s, Blacks advanced both socially and economically, making notable strides in a number of areas, including educational attainment, voting rights, equal housing, opportunities and earnings, as well as employment. These advancements came about during a period of favorable economic conditions However, it was also a time of social change which saw the passage of the Civil Rights Act of 64. Between 72 and 80, the number of employed blacks increased by 1.3 million or 17%. While their advancement in these occupational categories was proportionally greater than for whites, it was not sufficient to alter materially the overall black-white proportions of the previous decades and blacks continued to represent a disproportionately small number of white-collar workers. But this is where it gets interesting. Between 1972 and 1980, employment in the professional and technical occupations expanded rapidly, and both blacks and whites increased their participation in these fields. Accordingly, the number of black men in professional positions grew at slightly faster pace than that of white men during the decade. Still, in 1980, 16% of all white men were employed as professional workers, twice the black male proportion, two to one. Relative to their white counterparts, black women strengthened their foothold as professional workers. Black women professionals who had accounted for nearly 11% of all employed black women in 1972 made up 14% of the total in 1980, a proportion approaching that of white women. The most substantial movement among black women during the 1970s occurred in private household work as their proportion fell from 16 to 7%. One fourth of the employed black women had jobs in other service occupations in 1980. So these young people, these young women on Clubhouse are talking to me and don't make sense. I'm saying this to you because now I'm going to get deep, get deep. I'm going to show you right now that for, again, let's go all the way back. I want to read this again from Kimberly Crenshaw, just to be clear, in the context of employment discrimination, intersectionality was meant to draw attention to the many ways black women are being excluded from employment, industrial plants, and elsewhere. They were segregated by gender and race. Segregated by gender and race. Specifically, black jobs were available to blacks who were men. Okay. No time period. No time period, no years, no, she's not saying anything. This is... 10 to 20 years before her paper. So this is the prime period that she should be actually including in her paper. She omits this out of the discussion. This is what has created a mass amount of confusion within race. This is how we got here. See, the presumption is that black women stayed maids and didn't have opportunity and, and black men had way more opportunity throughout the 70s and into the 80s. Well, actually, what you actually see is, I'm going to read this in, right now to you, that did, that's not what happened. When you look at professional and technical jobs, and I'm not saying this to say I want less black women to have these jobs. 
I'm saying that you cannot say that intersectionality doesn't lead you to black maleness once you have these numbers. You can't say what she's saying and avoid these numbers. You have to say this in your paper after you talk about the manufacturing jobs, quote unquote, that I didn't really see in the 50s. Um, you have to also, like in mass number, I should say, you have to also talk about this in your paper. Even if it, I, I don't know how you get, got, got to do what you did. I don't know how this, this analysis of intersectionality got this far. So we're looking at this thing, professional and technical. In 1972, 6.4% of black men were occupied in professional and technical jobs, white collar. By 1980, we're at 8.2%. Again, this is 10 years to 15 or 20 years before her paper. So this is a period that should be in her paper. I'm talking about Kimberly Crenshaw's intersectionality paper of 89. When you look at black women for professional and technical jobs, in 1972, 10.6% of, of them have a professional or technical job. And by 1980, it's 13.8%. That is 40% more access to white collar jobs than black men. 10 years before the actual creation of intersectionality that has been entirely omitted from the discussion that clearly shows that it isn't just as easy as saying, well, black men have more opportunity. They're 40% less of the white collar jobs. How do we get here? How do we get to a point where we, we come over and we, and we can break it down even more. We don't have to stop at just white collar. This, this actually shows you by job. And I'm going to read it to you in a second. How much of this chart actually shows you how much of a percentage of the overall job that black women or black men occupied in 1972 or 1980 for all people. So for accountants, for accounts, let's start there. Black men were 2.1% of the accountants in 72. By 1980, they are 3.6% of the accountants. Understand that black women in 1972 are 5.2% or twice as many of the female accountants and 7.4% by 1980. That's uh, twice the rate of accountants. Again, you have intersectionality created a decade later and totally omits this truth. Let's go to other jobs and I'm just gonna read them real fast. Computer specialists, black men make up 2.1% of the computer specialists in 1972. By 1980, they make up 3.6%. Black women make up, uh, let me read it again, I'm sorry. Cause it's the way that they, professional, technical, accountant, it drops down. Engineer. So engineer, let's read that one. Engineers, 3.5% of the engineers are black men in 1972. 4.1% of the engineers are black men by 1980. Follow me. 6.5% of the engineers are black women in 1972. 9.3%, 9.3% of the engineers overall are black women by 1980. That's twice as many engineers. I, I, I just make it make sense. You can, I'll put the whole chart in the final version so you can see it. And all the jobs are that way. You look at them all. Um, we come down and we look at lawyers and judges. Black men in 1972, 1.3% of the lawyers and judges. They don't have really the data in 1972. By 1980, black men are 3.1% of the lawyers and judges. Black women are 7.1% of the lawyers and judges in 1980, 10 years before she came up with intersectionality. I'm just telling you, as I look at this discussion and I look at the quotes and I look at the original paper, a lot of it didn't make sense. A lot of it didn't take into account cultural norms. So again, women stayed at home. Uh, if we look back 1940, black men, black people were married at a 60% rate. Now, according to edu based on education, anywhere from 30 to 40%. Vastly different social setup. We all lived in it. We, we were coming out of slavery and Jim Crow. We did not create this system, but somehow we created a, a arc, a, a kind of a system as if black men created this, as if black men are, have, have, have access to maleness and none of it actually adds up. I want to keep on talking. Even when I look at it from a cultural aspect, I can't help but think about Barbara Johns. How many people heard about heard of Barbara Johns before? 
Barbara Johns is a key figure that started the Brown v. Board whole thing going on in, in Virginia. Now, one of the things that drew me to her for this part of the discussion is that in so many different ways, what ended up happening is that we ignored the fact that people like Barbara John show that we didn't even have a cultural norm across race. I'm not saying that individually in a specific home, there wasn't extreme misogyny. And I'm not saying that it wasn't practiced across America, but I'm saying that within race, Barbara Johns doesn't happen. And I'll explain to you what I mean. And if you have true, like kind of patriarchy you see in or developing countries, I should say. Barbara Johns is 16 years old, kicks off wanting equal access to schooling, takes it to the NAACP, essentially organizes for her town to uh, uh, have a whole speech, gets her family involved, gets the community involved. When the NAACP comes to speak at the town, she is the first to speak. They don't tell her that she's a woman and you can't speak. I think there has been talk, far, far too little talk about Barbara Johns and the reality of how black folks coming out of slavery and Jim Crow binded around blackness and far too much discussion about intersectionality. Calling this 310-388-3499. We're going to transition into the second part of the discussion after the first call. And we're going to go into the present and the reality of how none of this makes sense when you look all the way across from mass incarceration to abuse to wages to unemployment. Let's see. Let's hear what people got to talk about. Caller, what's your name? Where are you calling from? Yeah, I'm calling out of Philly. Um, I'm calling, I mean, you touched on it um, earlier, but I definitely want to reiterate what you reiterated. Um, this whole myth about black men jobs, what about all the black women jobs? Like, I mean, and they're not high tier. All these jobs, jobs are low, all these jobs are like low wage, low skill. Jobs, maids, yeah. nannies, um, nursing. All of these jobs were basically segregated for black people. A black man couldn't have gotten a job as a as any of those jobs. You know, so why is it that pointed out also that okay, look, there's black men jobs in manufacturing, but there are also black women jobs that a black man could have never ever well, their argument, yeah. well, their argument would be those are less quality jobs. And my argument would be go down there to that factory and lift them rocks if you want to. And I would say also that what they don't deal with is this 1970s like revolution in the, in the labor market, whereby like you see black women having 40 percent of the 40 uh, percent more access to white collar jobs. Now, we don't know where that comes out of, but maybe it does come out of the relationships you build in the, in the service sector being inside of homes. Maybe it's. Uh, uh, you know what I think it is is social dominance theory, which is the outgroup male, and I'll talk about it at, towards the end of the show. Is treated way worse than the, than the outgroup uh, female in terms of, of, of access and privilege, and we see that coming into today. I think that what you're saying is important, but they would say back that those aren't great jobs. I don't think many of these jobs were good at all. They were low wage jobs. Uh, anything else you want to say to the audience? Well, well, well yeah, just very quickly. Um, I just spoke about uh, social dominance theory versus the relationship that was built, I think that the fact that if you're more comfortable, if you're more comfortable with someone in your house, you're going to be more comfortable with them in a white collar job setting, like a white job, a white collar job setting versus a blue versus a blue collar job setting are two completely different environments. So whoever you're more comfortable with in your house is the person you're most likely going to be more comfortable with in a white college job setting so it might have a, a rhythm from there all right man uh, that's it man. It's thanks, actually man. Going to work, man. Thank you. yeah i just wanted to bring this because um i saw the brooke baldwin thing i think the celebration of the judges while i commend celebrating them was celebrated for the wrong reason it was celebrated based on gender and i, I really thought that this intersectionality thing when i especially when i get into this second half of the show really has been misapplied um entirely um let's take another caller Caller, what's your name? Where are you calling from? Yes, hi. I'm Juanita. I'm calling from Atlanta. Juanita, give me your take on this. She, uh, well, basically, she wouldn't, just for number of 
disagrees with her theory or her hypothesis as opposed to testing her hypothesis using the data and letting it fall where it may. Basically, that was the best of the paper. But what he says on another thing that I was thinking about is the increasing rate of eight hours Yeah, that's going to be the next section I'll talk about incarceration. But, you know, one of the things that I come back to that, that really kind of this discussion hangs its hat on is here you have a woman writing, and this goes to your hypothesis argument, writing a paper in 89 on intersectionality, but skipping over 1972 to 1980, where literally you see black women, and I'm not arguing against wanting to see those black women get access to white collar jobs, but when you have black men having 40% less access your paper cannot come out and say that black men have there are black jobs and that black men have all the black jobs. It doesn't even make sense. Would you agree? I agree. It doesn't make sense. It's the whole thing is the whole thing is focused on how they say she cooked the number. Mm. She, she didn't. She didn't. She didn't want to find out the truth. She just wanted to put what she thought was the truth out there, and nobody. I guess until now has said, you are flawed. You didn't use the right information. You know, when I, when I was in college, if I had done something like that, I would have got an F on the paper, probably with three red circles on it. And that's where our black economists you are know, supposed to come in. Our black economists are supposed to have done the work, our black sociologists, to basically say that this doesn't really make sense. Not the concept of intersections between gender and race, but where it actually leads us when the data is so dauntingly clear from white collar jobs in 72 to 80 to mass incarceration from 80 to present from uh, uh, wage levels. And I'll get into that in a second. When you add in black males that went to prison properly, those large number of black males, we're talking about 51 cents on the white male dollar, lowest of any group, two cents lower than Latino women from developing countries. Um, when you look at unemployment, we're talking about 53% unemployment in Milwaukee recently. For young black men, we're looking at a social collapse, but because we created this idea of intersectionality, we refuse to deal with it because it feels so much better just to say, well, I'm a woman and I'm a black, so I have double oppression. And for that, you know, that's what we need to celebrate this conversation with a friend of mine and, and uh, you know, we're talking about women and when women, I have two things to say about, about women. First of all, White men are not going to complain about this because they know they're going to bring the money home. Break it down like that. It's going to come right back to them. Come on. And, that, and that's, uh, what I, that's what I said about the white family. The wealth, see, the wealth not data comes up, comes in after she came up with this theory. And I don't know if she really fully like grasped that wealth is how it's held. So it doesn't matter if it's a white male or a white female. They transfer wealth. And we saw that with the ownership of, of black bodies by, by white women. It doesn't matter who goes to work because at the end of the day, she inherits the home. She inherits the privilege. I don't know if that doesn't fit inside of what she's done here. And it's highly problematic. Any last thing you want to say to the audience? But the, the only thing I want to say to the audience is that we know this is this is white privilege. Women have a bogus argument for feminism. And I, for one, cannot understand why any black woman would call herself a feminist. That is the stupidest thing I ever heard of in my life. And and not stand on that. And if somebody get a fit it, too bad. If you stick them in his head, try to get a fit it. And have your feet in jail. Man, anyway. I, I, thank you so much for calling. <laughs> I love when Juanita calls, um, you know, I, I, I personally have a belief that if you want to call yourself a feminist, everybody has a right to their uh, opinion, you know, just like Juanita does. Um, again, I think where we're at, though, is when it comes to this intersectionality, we've been socially dishonest about where it leads us. That brings me into the second part of the show, which deals with the present. I'm going to go from incarceration to abuse to wages to unemployment and then end out at social dominance theory. 
Um, when we look at incarceration, I, I created this chart and the numbers as I have them, uh, sources at the bottom of the chart, I have the final version, uh, have it up in the final version, had black men somewhere around like 8,000 per 100,000. Uh, understand to give that context, one of the highest rates of incarceration we've seen in the modern world was uh, South Africa during apartheid. Those black men were incarcerated at 800 per 100,000. What that's led to is a number of black men that is either on par or slightly below the number of black, uh, like at this point, because they've released some of all women in incarcerated across the whole globe. So 20 million, 23 million uh, black men in America produce either the same or right around the same number of prisoners as 4 billion women across the whole planet. Um, when you look at it, the numbers for black women, for white women, for Asian women, uh, they're infinitesimal. Um, I'm not saying that because I want more to go to prison, but I'm saying that in terms of, of how do you then get to an intersectional argument that doesn't start and end with prison. Just to be clear, incarceration, I know it's normal now in this society with first 48 and cops and everything, it is the next worst thing next to death. You see that with COVID, you see that with what happened down there in, in the South, I think it was Mississippi, with the prisons and the way they were getting treated and the conditions they were living in. Understand that what part of what we see as a problem is, and this is another chart that actually shows the rate of prisoners um, I think these numbers are a bit off, but they show 1.4 million male prisoners and 100,000 female. And this one, I think it's more like 1.7 million and, and like 200,000. Black men sentenced to more time for committing the exact same crime as a white person. Um, they're also sentenced for the same time, uh, for more time committing the exact same time crime as all women, basically, as well. They don't really write on this enough. Black men who commit the same crimes as white men receive federal prison sentences that are on average almost 20% longer and they're probably like 70 to 80% longer than all women. According to a new report on sentencing disparities from the United States Sentencing Commission. And one of the things that I see as problematic is people will say, well, don't black men do more crimes? They really don't do enough to have that kind of ratio where you get to 8,000 or 7,000 per 100,000 versus a few hundred per 100,000. That would mean they would be you would see it everywhere. Uh, like you just don't see, I, I don't even know how to explain to you like that that kind of variation is only created by social choice. I Meaning I've chosen that a certain group is gonna go to prison. Understand also we're in an era, rightfully so, where we're talking about uh, equal wages in, in sports, we're talking about equal facilities, but what we're not dealing with at the same time is that somehow this nation decided to build all the prisons for men. Like part of the reason that they don't put women in jail is they never built the jail. We all were born into a very, very equal society compared to any time prior, but they didn't even build the facilities to hold women if they do crimes. The reason why we know that is that, you know, I try, it's, it's, it's interesting because it's really hard to find the data when you look at uh, many states from Mississippi, to Louisiana, but shout out to Georgia, because Georgia actually listed their facilities, it's the, one of the only states that I found that did that, searching Google for hours. And what you find is that black men make up 50% of their prisoners, and I think they're like 15, 20% of the state. But the bigger thing also is to look up this. Look at the amount of male facilities. Almost every facility is a male. Every facility. So these are our prisons, and you basically see uh, they have one at the top that's juvenile, females, and adult, and then the rest seem like it's all males. Um, you, you see this here with the transitional housing. Basically, they built everything for males to go to prison. And the reason why this is important is that I don't know how you get to where we talk about intersectionality void of that truth. I, I, I absolutely have no, I have no question that if all the prisons for, for were for women, built for women, that we would be in the streets and it would be over as far as a discussion about the, the lack of parity and the sexism going on. I don't know what the sociologists and everybody didn't want to talk about it. And they dealt with it in the weirdest way by either not knowing the numbers or also saying that black, that men do more crimes. They don't do enough crimes where all the prisons are built for them in a society where people are relatively equal in terms of freedoms of moving around and property crimes and nonviolent crimes and drug crimes.
They just decided that women are not going to go to jail. Now, one of the ways they deal with that is that they give you numbers and they talk about the percentage of growth, but they don't really tell you it when it goes down. They only tell you when it goes up and they don't tell you the raw number. So what do I mean? So when black women go from 15 or 20,000 to 40,000, they'll say that it's been a hundred percent increase is the fastest growing population, but they won't tell you that 600,000 black men are incarcerated. And they won't tell you that 80,000 might've been added, but that it only increases the, the, the overall number by 10%, 12% or whatever else. Also, when it goes down, which we've seen in the last few years, they don't write any stories. I Googled for black women fastest decrease in prison population, and I only got black women fastest increasing when they were going up. So literally black women have now decreased, and this is something from the sentencing project here, and in this article, they show that between 2000 and this is this federal and state prisons. I think this leaves out the jails, which doubles the black male number and adds a third to black female numbers. But just giving you some kind of ratio, white men, uh, this is looking at state prisons and federal prisons. White women went from 34 per 100,000 to 48 per 100,000. White men went from 40, 449 per 100,000 to 385 per 100,000. That's an eight times ratio between their women and their men. Far too much. But listen to this. Black women went from 205 per 100,000 in 2000 to give the year to 83 per 100,000. That's 60% decrease in federal state prisons and, and, and uh, federal prisons and state prisons. Black men went from 3,400 3, to like 2,200, and I believe it goes up to like five or six when you add in the jails. That's 26 times uh, incarceration rate between black men and black women. And the reason why it's important in context of this discussion is intersectionality cannot have the kind of numbers we see with, with uh, occupation in 70s and 80s with this kind of mass incarceration gap and actually lead to a point where we don't see that this is actually ends up as social dominance theory where outgroup males are mistreated. I'm just, I'm just breaking it down piece by piece. Reason why we kind of know that those numbers would, were, were kind of, uh, off is that state prisons, they leave out this 33%, which is jails. And I think that's like dominated by males again. So like black males in particular. So I think that doubles the numbers for black males and it, Third, it adds a third to black females, but still we're talking about, we're talking maybe about like 25,000, 30,000 black females incarcerated at this point. I don't want more to go to prison or jail. What I am saying is that you can't have that kind of privilege in group and then just leave that out of the discussion when you talked about the intersections of race and gender. Um, the next thing that I want to talk about moving from incarceration into abuse. So, so often... You see this on Clubhouse. You see this on Twitter. People use individual anecdotal ex like experiences that might not even oftentimes be their own. They might have saw it on Lifetime, to be honest, to justify this intersectionalism through abuse. But what they don't tend to do is give you any kind of information or data. And I just wanted to share with you a brief study that I have that you can actually pick up as well. But before I share that study, one of the things that you see is they talk about deaths, but they don't talk about raw numbers. In this fact sheet out of the University of Minnesota, intimate partner homicides, and again, when we talk about abuse, they use the word IPV, which is intimate partner violence. IPV, it can be unidirectional, which is one partner hitting the other, or bidirectional, which is like each partner hitting each other. Intimate partner homicides among African Americans have declined sharply in the last 30 years. Partner homicides involving black men or black women decreased from a high of 1,576 to 475 in 2005 for a total decline of 70%. Again, there are 46 million now uh, uh, African-Americans across this nation. And we're talking about a few hundred people. That's like 0.01%, I think. Every life matters, but you can't take individuals when you get that low of a number and start to justify things like intersectionality around this as though there are cultural norms that don't support it. So that's just deaths. So somebody might say, well, I don't want to talk about deaths. I want to actually talk about the abuse. And I got that covered too, if you need me to. So great study. I covered it before, but I'll do it again. 
It took 50 studies that were done on unidirectional and bidirectional abuse across races using whites, blacks, and Latinos. And what it found is that women, white women and black women, actually abused at a two time higher rate than their mates. I'm just gonna read it. One highly debated topic within the field of intimate partner violence is the degree to which IPV, intimate partner violence, can be understood as primarily a unidirectional versus bidirectional phenomena. Early studies of IPV predominantly focused on men's perpetration of violence while women's involvement and our participation in IPV has been largely neglected. However, researchers have increasingly challenged the notion and studies have found that women can and do perpetrate violence at similar or higher rates than men. Included studies were published in 1990 or later, appeared in peer-reviewed journals, and contained empirical, uh, empirical data. Basically, they looked at 50 studies, 50 studies, 48 empirical studies, one meta-analysis, and one book chapter. Through it, what they found is here, let me read it to you. Specifically, only 50.9% of IPV was bi-directional according to white reporters, as compared to 49% among Hispanic reporters and 61.8% among black reporters. So black people have bi-directional abuse, which is more like fighting back and forth at a 61% rate compared to a 50% rate for white folks. Significantly different ratios of female to male partner violence to male to female partner violence. So female to male partner violence versus male to female partner violence. So we're obtained across ethnic groups such that the ratio was 2.27 for black reporters and 2.26 for white reporters. So 2.27 more times, you see that with black, with black women, female to male partner violence versus male to female. And for whites, it was 2.26. Again, I think this includes kicking, punching, spitting, where we move up things that don't end up getting reported because we have psychologists now going in in some of these studies and asking uh, uh, couples about questions that don't end up in police reports. See, when we move to police reports, then the black male numbers tick up because of the incarceration. So a lot of these young people, and I'm saying young, under the age of 40, they haven't really dug deep enough to have the opinion they have about intersectionality, abuse, incarceration. What you find is that is that black people have a lot of bi-directional violence and in addition you see a lot you see more black female to male partner violence than male to female partner violence you shouldn't see any of it but what i'm saying is that this really undermines the whole whole uh issue now one of the areas that you do see it go the other way where it where it's twice as many men is military when that when you came out of the military something it's like twice as many men hitting women i'm just again you can read it yourself Significantly different ratios of female to male partner violence to male to female partner violence were attained across the ethnic groups such that the ratio was 2.27 for black reporters, 2.26 for white reporters, and 1.34 for Hispanic reporters. Just saying. This expansive review of 50 studies shows, one, when you move beyond police reports to interviews, female to male partner violence is times two of male to female partner violence other than with the military. Just saying. Now we move to wages. We have black female payday. The presumption is that black men make more than you. Even when you don't dig in deeper, it was like a three to four cent gap, the smallest gap between between sexes of any group. The problem was, uh, and I have been saying it for years, the New York Times covered this. When you add in the incarcerated, because we have so many black men incarcerated that are making a dollar an hour or three dollars an hour in there, which is labor, you find that it drops that 67 percent on the white male dollar that black men had to 51 cents, which is two cents lower than the lowest group, which is Latina females. You find that black men are basically socially collapsed, economically collapsed. Black women are at 60 cents on the dollar, and no way am I making the same argument that's being made by far too many. I'm just looking uh, about like measuring oppression, but I am saying that you gotta be honest that black female payday doesn't work if that's the case, and it should just be black payday. But the problem is that that don't fit and fold into an argument about intersectionality. A lot of that doesn't deal with what we saw from the Bureau of Labor as we looked at 1972 to 1980, doesn't look at the incarceration, it does not look at the unemployment. Far too many people don't understand 
like when you look at this, this is the upper line. The upper line is without the incarcerated and, and uh, excluded workers. The lower line is when you add the incarcerated, it drops to 51 cents on the white male dollar, which is basically social collapse. They put these kind of uh, data points out, and what you see is the lowest group was the 53 cent for the Latina women. Again, black men, when you add in properly all of their workers, it's two cent below the lowest group. And these group and these Latina women are coming from developing countries. They're not, you know, we we're talking about black men that have been in America eight, nine generations, and largely it's because of social dominance theory and the treatment of outgroup males. Um, you have Milwaukee, where 53% of the of the black males were unemployed. Recently, you saw articles come out and talk about that. That is social collapse. This is a recent article that came out. Report analyzes high unemployment among black men. A recent report was, has analyzed the causes and potential solutions for why black men suffer from the highest unemployment rates of any race and gender group. Looking through BLS, Bureau of Labor uh, Statistics data, report author Dr. Harry J. Hosner, a non-resident senior fellow in economic studies at the Brookings Institute, found that black men had the lowest labor force participation rates among men. Low employment rates among black men have no single cause, but instead reflect a range of interacting and reinforcing demographic, social, and economic factors, plus adverse policy choices over time. What I will say also is that that BLS data was never built to deal with the incarcerated. So part of what he, what you're seeing with him is that is that uh, even when it says among men, when you add the incarcerated, it's among all people. You look at this, it says only one in four young black men have a job in New York City. This is a, this is a report done by the uh, Community Service Society Policy Brief. Somebody posted this, and I've shared it a couple of times, ran into this young man in Lancaster today. He didn't ask for money. All he asked for is an opportunity. You got him holding a sign that says, will you hire me? No felonies, high school diploma, and he could pass a drug test. You start to see all of this and ask the question, how did we get here where intersectionality led us to a path where you don't see this young man? What intersectionality actually does is creates a narrative where you can't see this young man because now he's a male, so why should he be not privileged? But in actuality, like maybe we forgot race and all of the oppressions and struggles that happen, that are shown in the BLS data that I shared earlier, but we've always been so dishonest. And I think for a lot of people, that's hard to digest. And, and as we look at the wages, we look at the unemployment, we look at the abuse, we look at the incarceration, so many of us struggle. Let's take another caller. Caller, what's your name? Where are you calling from? Peace Tone. I'm calling from Baltimore. Give me a take on everything. Um, well, one thing I want to say is that with, with the articles and things that you're mentioning that, that are giving us this information, um, specifically about the article from 89. When I was in school for journalism, and this is the honest truth, I had a professor to tell me that I spent too much time uh, demonstrating the whole picture in my writing, meaning I gave too much factual information. And so and this was 20 years ago. So I'm saying that to say that a lot of this uh, information that our people are running with on the uh, social media platforms and so on. It's information, like you said, they're getting it from articles that people have, you know, their empirical evidence in it, their own bias in it. And this is done to present certain narratives and uh, divert people's attention from the truth on a mass level. It doesn't mean that, they, that people can't find the charts like you find in different things, but it's way harder to find, especially dealing with the algorithms that are out there now in the Google searches. So bias is definitely going to be a big hurdle for us to overcome in, uh, you know, cracking these illusions that we're dealing with now and uh, these narratives that are being pushed. Now, as far as the incarceration element, um, you know, it, it seems to me that, you know, if you, if you go back a couple of generations, um, 
education could have played a role in, uh, you know, how things started to, to eventually get us to this point. Because the men in my family, I don't speak for my family, but the masses of them were from the South. You know, my grandfather and his brothers born before World War II. And most of those men were not college educated. Some of them had trades and skills, but they, you know, they didn't finish middle school, what we call middle school for the most part today. So our women were being educated, um, you know, a little bit more than the men from, I could say at least in, you know, from what I'm aware of, generations ago. And, and this, this, this movement to where we are now, it's been a process, Tom. It's been well over 50 years of work to get us here. And um, so, I mean, that's what I wanted to say because I, I, I called last week about the influence of, you know, the Saturday Night Live stuff and so on. We cannot discount how powerful this media tool is and, and, and guiding how we perceive things and so on. Um, so I, that's all I wanted to say. Thank you for the work, Tom. I appreciate you, man, and respect. Thank you, man. Great call. And so, you know, I told you guys in the beginning that I would come to social dominance theory, whether you see it as a direct contrast to intersectionality or actually where intersectionality ends up at when it actually looks at without bias or actual intent of where it leads you, it leads you to social dominance theory. I'm saying to you, uh, James Sintnow out of UCLA, he says the very popular double jeopardy hypothesis argue that women of color suffer from a double handicap and are discriminated against on the basis of both their gender and their ethnicity. However, this presentation argues that the popular thesis is fundamentally flawed. In its place, we substitute the subordinate male target hypothesis. This is, again, this is what we're talking about. Um, SMTH argues that while women from both dominant and subordinate arbitrary groups are discriminated against on the basis of gender, women from subordinate arbitrary set groups are generally not directly discriminated against based on on the basis of their arbitrary group membership, rather arbitrary set discrimination directed against males from sub, uh, subordinary arbitrary groups. So outgroup males are a threat to the, the dominant group, and as a result, which is the white males, and as a result, they, they get casted out. You see that with the incarceration wages and everything else. Now where it gets interesting is that white males, white females are the in group. What, what you end up doing as a result of intersectionality Instead of centering race, you make it one of a multiple set of things. And I think that race, meaning ADOSness, looking at lineage, looking at slavery, looking at Jim Crow, is the center. It is the heartbeat of what our oppression sits on. And what you see is if you don't start off with social dominance theory, you end up in a place where you, every number comes up and you just kind of want to push it to the side. I'm going to take one last caller for tonight. Um, I think this was a great, great show. Caller, what's your name? Where are you calling from? Hey, Tone, it's ADOS North. Can you hear me? Yeah, what's up, North? The floor is yours. Uh, yes. Um, so I just wanted to start off first and foremost uh, by saying uh, thank you for the accountability in which, the, uh, you know, the standard is clearly not being kept on how to how to um, collect data. Um, I'm forgetting the uh, woman's name that you were talking about. Kimberly uh, Crenshaw. Because I was basically, you know, uh, say that again? Kimberly Crenshaw. Yes. Um, you know, she, she just really didn't want to, want to get to the, well, she, well, she didn't, it, 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 it's an instance of what you just said. There was no, no charting before the, the 1990s so far as even income, wealth, or anything like that. So basically, she, 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 what she was doing was, she was, I believe it's what, uh, quantitative, where you're just describing how, uh, uh, describing how things look. Can I say one thing, North? Like North, just to just to cut it, about. North, just to cut in two things because you're absolutely on it. I recommend you guys go read her '89 paper because it's exactly what North is describing. But they had income, they didn't have wealth, and wealth tells us what comes out of the households. It moves beyond just the labor, and it also told, shows us that that revolving door of white wealth that moves us past gender to look at the cost of blackness over lifetimes. But go ahead, continue on. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, so that's basically what my call was about, because what, what is annoying the holy hell out of me is the, the standards of, of um, or non-standards, if you will, on how they're, how they're collecting this data. 
like I'm like I could have sworn that there was a. If I'm wrong, you can correct me. Like, is there not an entity in 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 um, academia that is basically uh, going to put these people in, uh, in some hot water or call them to task for the the improper way of collecting data? Well, there was no to me. She so that's, that's she, she just took a when you actually read when you actually read her paper, she just kind of made an assertion and then she looked at case cases singular cases like the way I saw it was just done backwards in, in terms of the assertion she was making but there wasn't even data to col she didn't use Bureau of Labor data in that paper nor in her speech that I saw I saw actually two of them and she didn't use Bureau of Labor data to actually support her claims and so when you when you're and, and, this, and that, again that, that's another point uh, point that I or issue if you will that I have with academia it's just like just have a slew of these individuals that can come out and they literally are just able to give anecdotal crap. They're able to just say anything. There's no, 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 uh, there's no adequacy in the data. None of that. It's, it's, it's none of these things going on. So, again, at the end of the day, I'm just glad that you exist to be able to point these shows and, and, and that there are grifters in academia. So, I appreciate you as always. I stay long. Thank you so much, Nor. I always love when you call. So essentially, I wanted to do this show. What, what made me kind of think about it was the Brooke Baldwin book. And, you know, essentially to me, really those black women, the celebration is them being black. And hopefully they do great work for the black community that they're part of down there. But I also wanted to talk about uh, moving into intersectionality and kind of break down information and show how problematic it is if you don't allow the data to tell the story versus you telling the story and then hoping that you find data and omitting certain things, whether you know that those things exist or not. This is Tone Talks. Please go to tonetalks.org to subscribe or donate. Share this video because if we don't have this discussion, it seems like no one else will. Thank you.